I had this ex-boyfriend who was amazing for the time we were together. Then he became a completely different person after I broke up with him. I'm not saying that he should have been happy about me breaking up with him, but we were both adults then. He was 29 and I was 27 when we ended our relationship. By that age, don't we all understand that even good things end sometimes? Anyways, the first month after the breakup was fine. He didn't call me. He didn't try to get me back, and I assumed he was moving on. Then comes the second month, and I'm coming back home after work. I see flowers by my doorstep. I wasn't dating anyone at the time, and it wasn't my birthday, so what the hell? At first, I thought it must have been delivered to the wrong address, but then I saw my name on a tiny card, and I also noticed the flowers were wild flowers picked by an amateur. They most certainly weren't from a flower shop. Weird, but whatever. I got better things to do than figure out the origin of this flower. I picked it up and threw it in the garbage. Without knowing who sent the flower, I wasn't about to bring it in inside my home. That night, I get a text from my ex-boyfriend. It's so like you to not appreciate what I do for you. I spent so much time to put them together, and you just threw them away like a piece of gum on your shoes. I was creeped out by the text, but not enough that I was going to be rude to him. I replied to him, "I didn't know they were from you, but even if I knew it, I couldn't accept it." And that was it. He didn't have anything to say about that. Then a week later, I step out of the office for lunch break, and on the hood of my car, I see a silver bracelet with two pendants attached to it. One of the pendants had the letter M inscribed, and the other had S on it. My first name is Mallory, and my ex's name just happens to be Sam. It wasn't hard to figure out who this was from. I don't know if what I did was a mistake. But I didn't want anything to do with the bracelet. Maybe it was a mean thing to do, but I just dropped it on the ground and drove away. I went home after work and no drama this time, no text or calls. I went to bed that night thinking he must have given up. How wrong I was! I wake up the next morning and the first thing I see is big red letters on my window. The letters read, "I will love you forever." The fucker was watching me sleep and wrote those letters on the window while I was completely defenseless. The thought of him standing outside my window watching me and writing those letters with lipstick just creeped me out to the max. I called the cops even though I knew they couldn't do much about it. My thing was I wanted to leave some kind of record, a proof that this had happened. So I did, and as you might have guessed, the cops left after filing a report, and that's it. The very next day, I made several calls to security professionals and hired one of them to install alarms and cameras all around the house. I felt better, but let's be real: the alarms would be too late by the time my throat is slashed, and the cameras would only record the happening and the aftermath. The so-called security systems are there to help with the investigation after the crime has been perpetrated, and they don't help in any way to prevent them. To add fuel to the fire, I soon began realizing that Sam knew his stuff. This probably wasn't the first time he stalked an ex-girlfriend. After installing the camera, he began coming around the house wearing hoodies and a face mask. I know this because the cameras captured them several times, coming around at 3 a.m., 4 a.m. when the whole neighborhood is asleep. He painted my bedroom window all black one time, left a half-burnt Barbie doll in my back door once, and he woke me up one night when he smashed the bathroom window. I knew he was escalating his aggression, but I still didn't feel as though my life was in danger. That is until one morning when I woke up, I couldn't find my cat anywhere in the house. He uses the cat door, but only when I'm awake, and he never wanders around outside when I'm sleeping or when I'm at work. But he wasn't home, so I looked for him outside and found my kitty decapitated in the backyard. I don't have any proof, but other than Sam, 
My cat wouldn't follow anyone outside through the cat door. Heartbroken and bawling, I called the cops and they obviously couldn't do anything about the hooded masked man in the camera footage. They told me they would increase the number of patrols in the neighborhood and also urged me to stay with a friend or a family member for a while. That's exactly what I did and stayed at a friend's place, which I thought was going to be temporary, but I'm still there almost a year after the incident. It's not like the police can guard my house 24-7. My evidence incriminating Sam is so circumstantial, so then what the hell do I do? I'm paying mortgage for a house I can't live in. I lost my best friend Kitty, and now I have a newfound fear of men, which I know is irrational because how many Sams are out there, but I can't help it. I feel as though it's inevitable until that day when Sam finally catches up with me when I'm most vulnerable. I've never imagined my life would ever turn out this way. Most people these days see killers as source of entertainment, something that brings out the feeling of excitement. Don't ask me why, but they don't really know the feeling of almost getting slaughtered in real life. Which is why I'm submitting this story to show you how horrifying it truly is. Me and my friend Emily have known each other for a long time now, so we wanted to spend a weekend together with a couple of friends to take a break from work and to relieve the stress that's built up in recent days. We called up five of our friends who were Chris, Kate, Josh, Jennifer, and Benjamin. We set up our house, balloons, drinks, food, etc. They all met up together halfway and got here around 8pm. That's when we all started to party and play out the music, not being respectful to our neighbors. It got to around 1 in the morning and I couldn't believe how fast the time had gone by. It seemed like just a blink of an eye. I saw all of my friends drunk and lying all over the place. The only few I saw were Chris, Josh and Jennifer in a deep sleep after all that partying. Emily was sitting in the kitchen on her laptop while Benjamin and Kate were upstairs doing god knows what. I decided to let the three of them sleep, so I walked out of the room and walked into the kitchen to see if Emily was okay. She was still on a laptop and searching online for a hotel since she wanted to go on a holiday sometime and bring me with her. I was about to respond to her but was interrupted by the sound of knocking on the door. I initially ignored it since I thought it was one of the neighbors going to complain to us about the music. Then there was another knock on the door, I shouted to them, go away, the party's over. You can go home now. I thought that would work, but it didn't. There was another knock on the door, but this time it was much louder. Emily advised me to call the police, but I answered, we don't have a reason to call them, and I'm too tired to call them anyways. Emily turned back to her laptop and proceeded doing what she was doing before. I went to the door and looked through the little hole to see who was out there knocking at this time. I wasn't shocked to find out that nobody was out there since they must have gone back to their house after knowing the party was over. But I was wrong, immediately after I took a step back from the door, I heard a knocking on my back door which was more disturbing. Emily jumped up in fear as she ran out of the kitchen and into my arms. I then saw Chris waking up to the sound, so I told him to wake up Josh and go outside to check if anyone was trying to break in. Chris woke up Josh and they both headed outside my house searching the bushes and the backyard. That woke everyone up and we all ran out to the back to see where Chris was at. We then saw Josh pointing my fence where Chris had been hurt. We all ran up to him and saw that Chris had cut his arm on the fence. There were some sharp nails hanging off the fence, don't ask why, but the injury wasn't too serious. We all helped Chris get inside, then we bandaged him up and let him sit on the couch. After that, we all started to settle down and agreed that the person knocking was just my neighbor in a moody mood. 
We all slept downstairs, and everyone were asleep aside from me. I was still awake in paranoia, doing a 360 around the room, searching the windows just in case. The time was now 2:58 a.m., so I decided it was time I went to sleep since I'd been sitting up for a long time, worrying about absolutely nothing. I got about eight minutes of sleep when I was awoken by the tapping sound of my window. I got up as quick as flash this time and swiped the curtains open. I wish I never done that now because it revealed who had been knocking on my door. The man had a full-on smiling face with a knife in his hand. I immediately screamed and woke everyone up in the room. The man smashed the window, grabbed my hair, and tried to stab me. Josh kicked the man in the face while Jennifer screamed the house down along with me and Emily as well. The man let go of me and said, "I won't let you get away with what you've done to me." As he ran away into the forest, Josh, Chris, and Benjamin chased after him, but we were too late as he was long gone. We all walked down to the police station and explained all of that's happened. The police advised me to stay with my parents for a few months, but the words the man said to me still scatter my head to this day. Did I know that person? I pondered for many days if I should send you this story, thinking that it's too ridiculous, too far out there. But the coincidences, and I'll soon explain to you what I mean by that, are too many and too spooky to keep this story for myself. I know the title I sent you sounds maybe too grandiose, but I promise you it wasn't for the impact. I only titled it as such because it perfectly describes what I'm trying to tell you. Let's begin from about half a year ago when this whole thing began. I own a home repair business, so my day begins at the crack of dawn. I don't watch TV Monday through Saturday because TV keeps you up late at nights, and in my line of business, lack of sleep always leads to accidents. I watch some YouTube videos during lunch, and all other frivolous things are done on Sunday and Sunday only. What I'm trying to get to is that I always sleep well. I must sleep well because my business is what pays for my children's tuition, my mortgage, and my hipster son's art career. Can you believe that he says he's got an art career and the boy can't even pay his rent on most months? I'm sorry about that, but leave that in the story, please. I want to hear myself rant about my idiot son through your voice. Moving on. It came as a surprise when, for a period of a week, I just couldn't sleep well. I constantly kept waking up in the middle of the night, in the middle of a dream, or at least what felt like a dream, and I was having a hard time getting some quality rest. It was affecting my work, so on week two, I bought a box of some over-the-counter sleeping aid pills, as usual, looking for some quick fix when it comes to the matter of health issues. The sleeping aid pills helped me fall asleep faster, I think, but it didn't help much with the part about waking up in the middle of the night. So I quit taking the damn thing, and it must have been about the third week of sleepless nights when one night I could clearly remember the dream I had. It was some asinine thing about my wife telling me to call our son, to be more supportive, and to believe in him. Looney talk. The dream made me flip a little. But guess what? After that dream, I slept like a baby and woke up in the morning feeling like a million bucks. So that morning, my wife's making breakfast and I sit on the table for a meal before I head out to work. Then fuck me in the ass. My wife starts talking about the same crap she was spewing in my dream. I don't want you to think that I don't respect my wife. God bless that woman for putting up with all my bullshit over the years. But she ain't perfect either. The woman could start an argument in an empty house, and she loves to get on my nerves sometimes. I wouldn't have found that too weird because she does this once in a while. But the details, the details were impeccable. She was wearing the same pair of pants and shirts, the same ones I saw in my dream. She also said the same things in the same order I heard in my dream. Heavens above, it was bizarre. 
but I was too irritated at what she said to bother thinking about it too much. Generations of hardworking men in our family, and I raised a boy who's about as useful as an ashtray on a motorcycle. Anyways, I come back from work the same day, and on that night, I slept through the entire night without waking up, but I had another dream. It was about as weird as watching a dog shed diamonds, because I don't normally remember my dreams, but it was happening two nights in a row. As you can imagine, I was keen to find out if the dream would again match real life. Holy fuck nugget, wouldn't you know it, it's like replaying the same scene in my BCR. My wife has made a scrambled egg, corned beef hash, some godforsaken salad, I can't stand cow feet, and an OJ on the side. She also yammers on about our dipshit neighbor encroaching our side of the yard, how I didn't get on his ass enough and that I should talk to him again. By the way, it may be too late, but I do apologize for my choice of words. I was raised with eight brothers by a father who worked in a mine, and I grew up working with men whose mouths were dirtier than a horse's panties. It's just the way I talk, so it's just the way I'ma write. You can rephrase the vile feces I type however you want. Getting back to the topic at hand, so this shit goes on for another week, and by then, even for a man like myself, no nonsense, always skeptical, no bullshit having roughneck, this was starting to get to me. Things became even crazier when I started dreaming about people other than my wife. I was on location, I had my guys working on a kitchen and bathroom renovation. I felt tired from lack of sleep, plus I don't handle heat all that well, so I was sweating like a whore in a church. I went outside, well away from the property, and was puffing on a cigarette as I normally do during breaks. What I didn't realize in that moment is that I unknowingly was repeating the same actions I took in my dream. Then the owner of the house walks out, all the way to the sidewalk where I was smoking, and she starts to complain about me smoking near her house. English isn't her first language, so she spoke broken English. She said, smell bad, no smoking here, please over there smoke. I just looked at her for a moment, probably long enough to make her feel awkward. She walked away after a short while, and I just stood there in amazement of what just happened. Everything that happened in that moment, I saw and heard in my dream, but with one key difference. Because as the days passed, I was seeing further into the future. So at first, when I would dream, I would see it play out the next day. But as time went on, I would see the things that happened in my dreams play out a week later and even further down the line. Then the question is, was I subconsciously trying to get a reaction from her, or did it happen as such because it was meant to happen? I don't know, but what I can tell you is that it all stopped on the fourth month. I no longer had dreams, and if I did, I do not remember them. Also, I've made notes of all my dreams, and the ones since the eighth day of month two haven't played out in real life yet. The one thing that bothered me though is the last dream I had. In that dream, I was dressed up like a homeless man and I'm so dirty, I might as well have not taken a shower in months. I'm standing right next to the Pittsburgh Greyhound bus station on 11th street near the convention center. There's no one on the streets, no traffic, but I do see lots of cars that have been abandoned and some dead bodies too. The buildings look run down. If I had to take a guess, I would say the whole city's been abandoned for at least 5 years. There's no sign of explosion or gunfire, it just looks like people were desperate to escape the city, or at the very least, they were trying to find refuge from something. I walked for a little while, trying to understand what I was seeing and tripped over a backpack left on the streets by someone. There was a newspaper beside the backpack and the bold title of the article on the page read, All hope lost for Europe and Asia. And my memory cuts off right there. So let me organize the whole event for you. The dreams from day 1 through 68 have already played out in real life. 
the dreams from day 69 haven't played out yet, so there's no way to know when the last dream is supposed to happen. I've tried looking at this rationally, and there are a few things that I can attribute to this insane experience. The first one, I'm crazy. The easiest answer, and maybe even the most obvious. But put yourself in my shoes and try to imagine how difficult it would be to try to make people do the exact same things they did in your dreams. To me, it sounds impossible. And I would also argue that an insane man like that couldn't run a business, be a father and a husband like I am right now. The second thing I can think of of causing this is that somehow I'm making connections where the connections don't exist. But can people do something like that for months and just stop one day for absolutely no reason? I don't know, maybe it's time to visit a shrink or maybe I just need a long vacation. As much as I want to ignore those dreams as temporary insanity, I just can't wipe off that last dream like it was nothing. Make what you'll make of it, but I said what I had to say and I know what I know. Thanks for reading my story. Alright, that is it for this video and of course I would like to thank Mallory, Haley and Frank for sending me their stories. If you guys have any legal advice for Mallory or any other advice for that matter, I'm sure she can use a different perspective on her circumstances, so do speak your mind in the comment section. As for Haley, in my opinion the best thing that we can hope for is that the intruder was just a random deranged man who tried to break into your house. You seem to be doing fine now and I'm very happy for that. I don't know when it happened but I think the prudent thing to do is to change your residence permanently. However, if that's not possible, at least stay somewhere else for an extended period of time. And lastly for Frank, if I were you, I think the dreams or what I know of the dreams would drive me crazy. So you are definitely a better man than I am, but for the sake of all of us, let us hope that it was all a coincidence combined with the susceptibility of the mind, but just to be safe, I am going to recheck my bug out back tonight. Alright, time to wrap things up. I hope you're all doing well. I'm glad to report my life has been A-OK -okay, and this is not a vlog so I'm going to shut up now before I turn this thing into a 10 minute long outro. Thanks for watching everyone and as always, stay safe.